Good evening, mathematicians and lay math enthusiasts. My name is Jeff Cook, and this is the eighth video in a series which I've put together with my co-authors. Well, they worked on the paper with me, but I'm, I'm doing the videos. And this series is entitled A Direct Proof of the Riemann Hypothesis. Okay, so if you haven't watched the other seven videos, just understand that two years ago, this past September, my co-authors and I have uploaded a preprint of a direct proof of the Riemann Hypothesis to ResearchGate, and we have close to 9,000 reads, handful of rec 10 recommendations, not all of them are mathematicians, but recommendations from some mathematicians. And uh, um, we have been in many conversations, emails, texts, and everything with a large number of, well, not a large number, a handful of good mathematicians who I have approached, who I like to speak with, um, and no errors have been found in this paper. Now, will they state that? I do believe eventually, I do believe it. And uh, um, I think so it's gonna be start something like this. I do not find any errors in this proof at this time. Or it's gonna be something premised with, uh, I doubt the proof is valid, but at this time, I do not see any errors. Or even worse, it's gonna be, I know the proof is wrong, but I don't see any errors at this time. And I know that because that was actually one of the last emails we had from some of the mathematicians. I know it has to be wrong, but I don't find any errors at this time. And I don't have time more. So that was after months, months of discussion. So I am telling you, this proof is starting to look really good if you are in support of our efforts. Okay, but this video is not gonna have to do with the, uh, the, the Riemann hypothesis directly. So we're gonna talk about and prove that no trivial zeros exist within the critical strip. And you may ask yourself, why would you do that? Because we already know um, that no trivial zeros exist within the critical strip. The reason is, is some mathematicians, I think they're looking at it and they're thinking, well, I don't see an error. So it must be something they're dividing by zero somewhere. It must be some simple mistake. There's a lot of mathematical tricks out there and the non-trivial zeros are, are it's a complicated study. Anything in the critical strip is really gets confusing and cloudy. And so that's why we're applying this proof to negative even integers, the trivial zeros. Do you think that mathematicians would be able to refute or approve a proof saying something about the trivial zeros? Is there any mystery in them? Not really, that's why they're trivial. Okay, so that's why we're applying the same proof we did for the Riemann hypothesis to the trivial zeros. And I think you're gonna like this. If you don't get goosebumps, at least at one point in this video, I think maybe you're a little mathematically sedated or you're sleepy or something. So wake up. This is a long video. Think of it as a feature film. Treat it as such. Grab your friends, uh, mathematician friends. It's not a date. And uh, um, get, get the popcorn out and just follow along, all right? There are no tricks. And if there are, you should be smart enough to find them. But there aren't. All right. Five uh, sections to this video, five little, um, if you got my little outline, this is not scripted, so I'm not the most eloquent, eloquent speaker. I can discuss mathematics, and you will see because this is all in one sitting, and I'm just gonna kinda go through it as though I'm presenting at a conference, which I haven't been able to do for a handful of years, so that's all this is, or better yet, no, me sitting down with you over coffee, tea, or whatever drink you choose, and just kinda me presenting it to you, and let it, dig into your brain and see where it lands. Okay, first we're gonna go, I'm gonna go over to, well, we, you and me, are gonna go over the, the Riemann hypothesis proof, just to give a little background, and who we are as, as my team and authors. Okay, so you can go get the proof, the Riemann hypothesis proof, do a search at, at any search engine and type in Jeff Cook Riemann hypothesis, and it should come up pretty quickly. First one here on DuckDuckGo. And then you can go see all the stats, 10 recommendations, 8,793 reads. Um, it was published in September 2020. And our authors, and you can link to our authors. You do not need to be a published researcher to download the PDF. Um, so anyone can go get it. As I was doing a search, I kind of saw that there's a little discussion going on over at Quora. I'm not sure what a Quora is, but um, sounds confusing. But had this... Uh, um, very wordy title or question. Are the YouTube videos by Jeff Cook and two others currently doing the rounds and claiming to have solved the Riemann hypothesis 
Yet another crank attempt by unqualified mathematicians. Mathematicians being in quotes. So I'm going to let you be the judge of that. Let's, let's just look to see what a crank attempt is. Um, look at this comment here. That is a crank attempt. I am familiar with algorithms of this. What they do is this is computer generated, um, a computer generated comment. It, so what it does, and I've seen the papers have been submitted to journals um, using this, where the algorithm can go into um, various, uh, what do they call it, peer-reviewed you know articles and grab sentences and pieces and put it together and present it as though it was meaningful. But it, it's nonsense. It's gibberish. It means nothing. In fact, papers have been submitted to publishers. I, I don't know the name of it, but um, and been accepted by th their papers with this computer-generated nonsense has been accepted by their um, examiners. All right, so that would be a crank attempt. All right, unqualified mathematicians. I really don't know what an unqualified mathematician is. This mathematician quote. But let me tell you about Greg Volk. He is perhaps the most intelligent person I've ever met. He is very, very sharp, learns very quickly, and processes in a very unique way, and he can speak eloquently and get his point across to a wide range of audience. But more important, he's creative too, and he comes up with some really neat ideas. In fact, the other day, he called me and he said he presented at Tesla Tech, which is where we met more than a decade ago, and he, in this two, oops, <laughs> I got the keyboard on my lap. Let's go back. All right, where is he? Where is he? Sorry about that. But, all right, so here, here he, we met more than a decade ago, and Tesla Tech, you know, some of the audience are mathematically inclined, some are not. Um, it's, it's a wide range of audience, and um, so he's presenting to that, and he had extra time. Somebody um, canceled out, and so his talk went into a two-hour talk, and it's a bit broad. I kind of told him, I said, it's genius, but every one of these points that you made could be a talk on its own. And uh, um, in there, though, he has, I, th I think I counted five new mathematical breakthroughs. One of them, tell me, tell me this, is this a, a crack math ma mathematician? One of them is a new way of uh, solving the quadratic equation in your head, and he shows how to do it. Right, that's really impressive. You know the quadratic equation kind of explodes up, you know, gets really big. It's hard to re reduce things back, but it gives you a solution. It's very old. All right, he has a new way of doing it. I actually think it should be taught in every high school. It could, it, almost in all arguments, you can actually do it in your head. Very ingenious. He's got a lot of things like that. Just go listen. Five, ten minutes. and eh, Make it a half hour. Make it worth your while. And tell me, okay? He, he's just he's very bright, all right? All right, so I don't make him blush because I need to watch this. All right, Dennis, all right, he's got his PhD in mathematics. Do you think when you dedicate your life to math mathematics, that allows you to remove the quotes around the word mathematician, all right? I mean, I think, I think you understand where I'm going with this, okay? Uh, Den Dennis, right now, he's currently doing some talks on alternative science, and what I mean is alternative is there's a lot of science out there where uh, it's still in the theory mode and no invention has ever come from it, all right? So there's no, no one's ever seen, I don't want to get a name any because I don't want to, going down a different tangent but they discuss those things and he he often invites me to them but i per i personally not really interested in theory i like things that work that are, are provable facts turns on and turns off and does exactly what it's supposed to do every single time and so there's not many people for me i'm only going to talk about um i, I don't like talking about myself really quick so i'm just going to go through a few things that that i know uh, are factual and uh, um do qualify me. There's not many people in this world, nor in the history books, who have found a new magnetic or electric magnetic pro property, much less 16, as I have found. Okay, so I have received a grant, which was actually one of the other projects I worked on with, with Greg, and uh, um, I have found over 16 new properties of magnets and that uh, anomalies and mechanisms that nobody's ever discovered before, and the U.S. Patent Office does tend to agree that they are novels because I've had two issue, patents issued. I filed a large number of, of them, but I, I saw, you know, there's a lot of fees, so you kind of let some of them just kind of go by the wayside. But some I followed through with because they can make something marketable, and which is the other aspect of my mathematics is the engineering and design. So if, if you can understand the complexity of um, the mathematics involved in, in magnetics, imagine a field where you can put a little toy car on a ramp and it gets sucked up per, per, perfectly 
into the chamber, locks into place, and you turn a lever, and it shoots out the other side 25 miles per hour across the room every single time without fail, not using any batteries, electricity, or spring. Would you say there's any mathematics involved in that? It's very, very complicated mathematics, and that is one of my inventions, the Zeta Launcher. And another one here is the, uh, the OrbFlex, where, which is another patent I received, is the, uh, um, where I invented an inverse, what do you call it? Inverted gyroscope. It's really interesting, you know, so a gyroscope kind of holds its uh, um, position. And, and this one, so both of them are all mysterious and, and interesting. Hard to believe they work. A lot of people don't believe they work until they actually see it in, in person. But you can go watch some videos. There's some uh, gym that has some orb flexes. They have some videos on it. Pretty neat. Okay, so that's who we are. And uh, um, so my contribution to this is that I have a tendency of finding things that other people thought were impossible to do or no one's ever thought of. And you will see that that is kind of what I do with the proof because that's it's just that's my ability, all right? So I can find new things, and, and sometimes I fumble my way through it, but I do end up describing it, um, and I make sure that always works. That's the big thing. So I meet, it always has to work. I don't like theory. I don't want any question. don't want any opinions. I want turn it on, and it better work every time. No bugs. All right. So this is the second group, naive set theory. Now, I'm going to really zip through this because naive set theory, a lot of people are going to consider this like foreign language. So almost every word that I'm going to go over to most of the, the viewers of this, it's just not going to sink in because it's like kind of like hearing, you know, French. If you're, you don't know French and you're speaking English or vice versa. A lot of new words, a lot of new um, terminology. But here's the thing. Everybody... Everybody, even I would say single cell organisms, understand groups and sets. Otherwise, how do you eat? All right, so if you have a basket of fruit, you can differentiate between that basket of fruit and a basket of kitchen utensils. And you can understand that within that basket of fruit, you might have apples, oranges, and bananas, and those are subgroups. And within the subgroup of apples, you might have Jonathan apples, Gala apples, or Red Delicious, which are not delicious at all. And you can understand this just by closing your eyes, you don't even need to think about it. It just is. You see it immediately. Everybody does. Um, so, but when you get into the terminology and make it a little complicated. So we're talking about the trivial zeros. And so they, that is a group. That is a single entity. They are a cyclic group of addition modulo n. As the example here, they all differ by a multiple of n minus 2n. So minus 4 equals minus 2n. What is n? 2. You can also say that they are congruent to 0 mod 2, right? That is a group. We can treat that group as a single entity and do things with it and move it around and challenge it in ways that we can do any other single entity, okay? Now, what the reason I'm going over this is because I think there's a lot of people that are going to read the paper that don't understand what an image is. They don't understand. So they're not going to understand what the proof. They're going to understand the terminology, how this proof ends, so you build up and you go, I follow that, follow that, follow that. And I get to the end and go, I don't know what an image is. I don't know what a homomorphism is. I don't know what it is. So we're going to I mean, zip by it so that at least it's in your head so that when you hear it, you go, okay, where did I get this? All right. So it comes from naive set theory. Now you can go read up on groups and sets and you can go read up about everything that I'm showing. Everything is just right from Wikipedia. Now say what you want about Wikipedia when it comes to math. Wikipedia is a very great platform to start your, your journey, okay? And they reference some really good books and, and documents in there. So mathematics, Wikipedia, I'm with you. All right, just about everything else, controversial, anything questionable, going one way or another, it just becomes a, a mess because there's everyone in there is arguing to get the right <laughs> content in there. Math, not the case. All right, so go over there and, and read up on this for more background. All right, so what is an image? Well, there can be an image of a group. There can be an image of the element the image of the function, each have slightly different meaning. I'm interested right here in the image of a function, function is the set of all output values it may produce. All right, so values is the most important thing here. If you're, you're going up to a, a snack dispenser and you want to put some money in, you want to get some snack out, you see its value, you go, I agree, that's worth that amount, I'm going to put this money in. All right, if it doesn't give you that value output, you get angry and shake the machine, even though that doesn't really help. Very rarely do you ever walk by a machine and also just spits out chips at you, okay? 
Typically, if it's functioning properly, you put some value in, you get some value out. All right, that's why I like to resort every single time, all the time. Function must give some value out. If, if somebody gives me a function and I can't get a value out, of it, I can't put any value in because I don't know if it exists and it's not getting any values out, it's nonsense. It's not in, you have, no, you have empty image, all right? So that's where we get on there. Now, this image is very important when mapping two groups, all right? So remember, you got the trivial zeros, you got the non-trivial zeros, you got the critical non-trivial zeros, and we have what we're gonna add today, hypothetical trivial zeros within the critical strip. These all fit into subgroups and we're gonna all put them in this neat little thing. How do you tell if there's infinite number of these elements in this group if they share characteristics? How do you, can you move them to a new group? We're gonna go over all that, you can, it's very neat. The end result is going to be of the proof, what's called the inverse image or pre-image, okay? We're gonna come back to that. All right, so image, again, is the function that maps one set to another, x to y, okay? The image of an element, I'm gonna read over it. It's, it's so wordy, just close your eyes, listen to it, this, that's why I think this is best when explaining it to somebody who's unfamiliar with it. Close your eyes, don't think, don't try to understand it, to understand it, just hear it. Because when later when you hear it brought up, you'll go, ooh, I triggered a memory, okay? So don't process it, don't do anything, don't try to follow it. If you already know it, good, all right? But this is not very well written, but it's, it, it is, it's just not giving, it's not very telling. All right, let's just go through it. Image of an element. If x, little x is a member of big X, then the image of x under f, which again is the function, denoted f of x is the value, we talked about value, of f when applied to x. f of x is alternatively known as the output of f for argument x. Given y, the function f is said to take the value y or take y as a value if there exists some x in the function's domain such that f of x equals y. Similarly, given a set s, f is said to take value in s if there exists some x in the function's domain such that f of x is contained in s. However, f takes all values in s and f is valued in s means that f of x is contained in s for every point x in f's domain. What the heck? <laughs> okay, all right, so if you're like me, that is not very clear, but it it, do, it is correct, okay? And so we're gonna use every single statement here in the proof. And I'm gonna, it's just, and then hopefully you will absorb all of that, okay? Because we're actually use it all. All right, there's another term, another French term or Arabic term, some term you, you in another language you don't know, is called fiber. Now, many of you mathematicians, of course, you know. I'm not insulting your intelligence, but understand my audience is going two different directions too. There's those who are willing to learn this and there's the, those who understand it already. That's it, all right? So we have to kind of I speak to both of them. Fiber is not, not typically a word that most mathematicians from a high school level will understand. And I wanna get this understanding of this proof for anyone having just a high school mathematics background, okay? In naive set theory, the fiber of the element y, little y, in the set big Y under a map F that maps X to Y is the inverse image, remember we talked about that, of the singleton under F. What is a singleton? Well, if we have the basket of F, that singleton, and say we only have one Jonathan Apple, that set is a singleton, okay? There's only one element in that uh, set, okay? Now, sometimes people take, they take a, um, they give a value, all right, to the, the pre-image, all right, all right, let me start over here. If you have an empty set, you may run into um, vacuous truths and you may run into some other problems. So a lot of people would just kind of put in the word null and consider it an element in its own right. And, and here's what we're gonna do. So that would be the fiber, okay? So it would be the inverse image of the singleton. Now, some, as it says here, one usually takes Y in the image of F to avoid the inverse Y of Y being the empty set. All right, let's kind of just skip past that and go to what possibilities could happen. So you could end up with um, some properties that are vacuously true for the empty set. We do not want this in a proof, all right? What is a vacuous truth for those who are unfamiliar? It's just that the antecedent hasn't been satisfied, all right? So to their example, for an integer x, let's let that x be two. If x is greater than five, then x is greater than three. So 
that statement is vacuously true because two could be an integer. So how do you fix that to make sure that this doesn't arise in your proof? Hopefully, in all cases, you can remove these. You just get rid of the first x, the comma, and the if. And just say for any integer x greater than 5, x is greater than 3. Get rid of the conditional. You want to try to avoid so that things are based on a condition. All right, so the antecedent, just think of it as a, a premise. All right, so p, if p, then q. So it's the first part of the, the uh, um, hypothetical proposition. Now, when you get a lemma that p may be a lemma proven, then you just say because p, then q. And that's exactly what we do. We have three lemmas would it go through. Now, that all out of the way, I want to take a drink. And uh, mm -hmm. this next part is where the beauty comes in. We're going to apply all of that, what we just kind of learn as we go forward. All right, and we're going to do it in a really simple way. A plus B plus C equals zero. All right, that's where we're leaning towards. First, we wanna we wanna bring this into we wanna bring this into the Riemann zeta function. Here, off in the corner, because I'm gonna fill this screen up. Off in this corner, I have Riemann's functional equation. It gives us the identity of Riemann's symmetric properties, uh, Riemann's symmetric vertices property, which is that. If there are any non-trivial zeros off the critical line, then they exist at the vertices of rectangles, symmetric across the real line, and symmetric across the critical line. Okay, we get that from a function in, in Riemann's paper, um, which was a psi function. And we also can see it here with zeta of s and zeta of one minus s. Those two functions um, will have zeros. If one has a zero, the other has a zero, and they will, you could draw a line from them, plot it on the complex plane, right through the real point one half. Even if they don't have a real part one half, there's still gonna be a line you could draw through that point one half. You can get that out of this functional equation. You get a lot of things out of this functional equation, but it's never really given any insight into the Riemann hypothesis. And it's not gonna give us any insight in, I suppose we could do a proof that no trivial zeros exist within the critical strip with this, because that's how Riemann came to understand them. But we're not going to, whereas we're gonna treat those possible trivial zeros in the critical strip identically as those off the critical line, the possible hypothetical non-trivial zeros or that are also non-critical, okay? So let's just say that function is gonna globally encompass all the elements of the zeta function, but the form is not gonna give all the information that we want. All right, so we're gonna form a group and this is what I think you're gonna like. Okay, take this, for every group that I form here, I'm gonna give a new shape, okay? And if, if something can fit into it, then it's a new group. And each group is gonna have a mathematical identity. Here, it is the zeros of the zeta function. We're gonna put this, all this big purple oval is gonna be represented with a square. When we see that square, we say that is a definition. All the zeros must fit into that definition that they must be zeros, right? So if it pops out zeta of s equals three, that's, that wouldn't fit in this group. So this is a local, it's locally defined, the other is globally, okay, makes sense? All right, now we may have some other zeros in there too, okay? So if we treat the circle as being the trivial zeros that we all know and love, minus two, minus four, and so on and so forth, and then the, the triangle over here, let's say that this is the, the critical zeros, those having a real part one half. We might have a couple other zeros too here. We might have some that are um, non-trivial zeros off the critical line and trivial zeros may be in the critical strip, right? Hypothetical, all right? So these are all zeros. They all must fit into, all must fit into the square. Oh, look, they do. They all fit into the square nicely. So they, that, whatever property we have come up with that they could exist, then they also fit into that definition. That definition alone, that they're zeros, is not enough to prove anything at this point. So we have to create another group. All right, let's create, split this up into two groups. And that's what Riemann's functional equation does very nicely. And this is the way most people approach, have approached the Riemann hypothesis, studying the critical strip. All right, and, and of course you should, you should study the critical strip because we have all of the non-trivial zeros, they exist within there. We know that has to be true. But as a group, 
we also have this problem that there could be these little hypothetical buggers in there that may not belong. So what do we do about that? We have to move them into a different group, but allow that so that they maintain the same properties that they all have symmetric vertices. Notice symmetric vertices, so you draw a line from top to bottom, and you got a vertice here, vertice here, all of them have that. And I use the triangle for the critical zeros because there's only two, just like there's only two having a real part one half. There's the one S and it's complex conjugate. Anywho, getting a little too deep into these shapes. All right, good. So I wanna take Riemann's functional equation and discard it, okay? It, it gave us the information that we needed. Now, we included this in the paper and, and so many mathematicians they get stuck on this. They go, oh, no, it's the function equation. We know there could be other function equations. No, you don't understand the point of the paper. We're taking the function. Trust me, this is the number one issue with mathematicians. They see that and they put it down. We're showing we're taking the function equation, recognizing its symmetric vertices property, and then we're discarding it. We never to look at it again. We don't want to discuss it because it doesn't give us any information to the Riemann hypothesis, exactly as you're saying. We are interested in this form over here, okay? This does give us the information we want, and it has the a plus b plus c equals zero, so we're gonna discuss that. All right, so we have these two groups. We wanna form a new group from some other form of the zeta function, other, other way of looking at it. It's the same function. All the elements in one is in the other. It is the zeta function, but we're gonna set it to zero, and now it's not global, and we're describing specifically this oval. When we set it to zero, we can solve back for upsilon, so it's upsilon in the second term right here, and we get the general solution for all the zeros of the zeta function right there, okay? So you could probably do this with the, I'm not even gonna bother, because we're just we're discarding the uh, um, functional equation. So this is what we're doing. We're left with this now describing our oval, our global or our local groups. And we, we want, how are we gonna define our shapes? Okay, so we wanna fit objects into what we do know. We know that here, the trivial zeros that are outside the quick strip, all negative, uh, even integers. And we, they have to fit in the, somehow that definition. And we know that the critical zeros that we do know have real part one half. So we're gonna take those properties and put the others in groups accordingly, all right? So when the Riemann zeta function is zero and upsilon equals zero, the real part is gonna be one half. And then the other group is gonna involve those that zeta function equals zero, upsilon does not equal zero, and they do not have a real part one half. We'll get into this more with the reverse implications, but let's just go, those are gonna way we're gonna define the two different groups. And so we go, okay, well, this shape doesn't fit into the definition of having real part one half, like the, the critical zeros we know. This one doesn't either, so where do we put them? They do fit in here. Since they absolutely do not fit into this one, they must be in the other, because that's all of the zeros of the zeta function. So they are in this other group over here, and they do fit in to that little circle De circular definition, and we can eliminate, it's not a circular definition, it's a circle, <laughs> um, but we can eliminate then the functional equation. We don't ever have to look at it again. We just are gonna remember that what is preserved from these that we brought over, they still have their symmetric vertices. Do you understand that? They still have the symmetric vertices, but we're now looking at them in a different way, with a different definition. And this is the only element, actually there's an infinite number of elements in there, but this is the only type <coughs> right here is the triangle. So that would be those with the, the um, have a real part one half. So we put them in this group over here and then we can see if they belong or maybe we have to eliminate them. Maybe this is a group where vertices are mathematically impossible, much less symmetric vertices. And that is exactly what we're doing. We just took them out of this group over here we dropped the, def the, the function equation, found something new in this other form of the zeta function, and we can now group those other elements in a different way and prove that they're not mathematically possible. And that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna show how, how it's done right here in a very simple way. Define two types of zeros. 
all right, out of this. A plus B plus C equals zero. All right, there are only two types, and they can be grouped in this way. All right, one type is zero, and the other two terms negate each other. Now, the other two terms may be zero, but not necessarily zero, okay? That is a linear solution, and it is called a linear solution because all the solutions fall on a line. The other type is um, not, it's not much more complicated. We're just talking a plus b plus c equals zero, but it has a couple other conditionals, a couple subgroups. A plus b, well, let's simplify. None of the terms are necessarily zero, but two terms negate the third. So in this way, a plus c equals minus b, or a plus b equals minus c, or b plus c equals minus a, and that is a planar solution because all the solutions fall on a plane. And we're gonna come back to this. All right, is there a type three? Well, some may naively say that yes, if they're all zero, but those actually fit into type one because if one term, if, if c is zero, then a equals minus b, which are also zero, so minus one times zero equals zero is a true statement. So that's type one, but it's also type two, all right? So if all the zeros or all the terms are zero, then you can also say, well, a plus c equals minus b. Minus one times zero does equal zero plus zero. That is a true statement as well. All right, so it is that that is um, an example of a solution that's in both type one and type two. There are only two types, but there's this other condition that could be in both at the same time. So we would say that that is not mutually exclusive. All right, they're, they're in both of them. They may be in both. You can look at it either way. We don't want a proof like that. We want a proof where type one and type two are mutually exclusive so that any of the, the, one, any of the values in one cannot be in the other. All right, so um, we're gonna separate it into groups having to do with the real part one half and epsilon equals zero. And so we can't have any trivial zeros in that group at all. They only, they must have real part one half. All right, so that makes sense. All right, and, the, and in the same way, we don't want any, any zeros with real part one half to accidentally be over in the other group either. We have to prove that they're both are mutually exclusive, okay, for what we want to do. All right, now let's look at the type two of the plane. If you notice, um, the linear solution it exists within the planar solution. So you see it is there um, in reference, but remember we, we want to have it mutually exclusive. But with a plus b plus c equals zero, you saw that there's this one condition where it's not mutually exclusive. So a plus b plus c equals zero, you get this. But check this out. If you're like me, and God help you if you are, you might want to look to see how would we rotate that planar solution to the imaginary axis and then translate it to the critical line. Could we do that? Since we do have these six points, one, two, three, four, five, six on this plane, and we do have these six points on the critical zeros, or non yeah, not only non-critical, non-trivial zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, because all the zeros must, if they exist off the critical line, must exist at the, the corners of, or the vertices of rectangles, symmetric across the real line, and symmetric across the critical line. They have to, and we also have those on the critical line, so that's six points. That's what we wanna do. We wanna get, rotate that over there. So here's a very naive way of describing how we're gonna do that. What point do we want it to go over? If you take row H here, where's my cursor? Row H here, and one minus row H, you draw a line, it's gonna go through what point, right? It's gonna go through one half. And if this is X and Y, and you think of a Z coordinate system, where do we wanna rotate? Well, first, before doing anything, we gotta get rid of zeta function. We can't set this equal here because it's, it's undefined, A, B, C are undefined. So we're just gonna just focus on, you know, let's just say later zeta, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I get tired of one of these things, that's fun. All right, so we're going to think of it in terms of co coefficients. We're going to rotate it on the y-axis. So think of x, y, z, we're going to rotate it on the y-axis. So let's kind of just bring b over to the right-hand side, subtract it by both sides. And we want to translate to where? One half. Like I said, we're naively demonstrating this. And we're doing it on what axis? The y-axis. Well, we don't like the half, so we're going to just kind of, oh, I want to swap that out because I don't want to use it. Um, so we're just set y equal to four times some variable, which has some randomly arbitrarily grabbing upsilon. And we're just going to kind of 
add that back into our equation and take a look here. Now, that's not enough to rotate it all the way, but it's getting our start, all right? But before we go to the next parts, um, we have to guarantee that we're gonna have mutual exclusivity. We're building a function, and somehow we're gonna do something with it, and it's gonna equal the zeta function, all right? How do we guarantee mutual exclusivity before we get to that point? Well, just make sure that A, B, and C, which are gonna be function, become functions, make sure that they have no zeros at all. And this is not terribly hard to do. All right, so this way, the second term, we want that, remember that first type where the, the second term goes to zero? All right, we want that to be governed by upsilon. So we want the real part one half is gonna be our destination or our end goal and upsilon also is gonna equal zero in that case. So we kind of make sure that a, b, and c cannot equal zero, and we're gonna make that the rest determined by upsilon. All right, so see that? So that goes to zero, we're gonna have a equals minus c. All right, this is already starting to look like a harmonic oscillator, believe it or not, and that's all we're doing is constructing a harmonic oscillator. And very soon, I'm gonna show you why. Actually, I spent the effort to try to do this, and this was the finding I sent to Greg and Denny. Let's, little background, Take a little drink of water, stand up a stretch, as Greg always says in his presentations. Mm -hmm. Ah, good water. Not really. All right. Um, good. Where am I at? Background on a harmonic oscillator. Okay. What is a harmonic oscillator? Well, a swing is a harmonic oscillator. Just think of a swing. That's one type. Um, my daughter, she likes to go to the swings, and she's trying to figure it out. She's four years old. She doesn't have the coordination of it. It's kind of funny for me. She can dance really good, so she's coordinated. It's just she can't really get, she doesn't get the timing of swinging the feet forward when she's going forward, at the same time pulling back with her arms and doing the reverse to go backwards. She doesn't got, she doesn't yet understand the fundamental frequency of the swing. All right, so that is a, that example of a harmonic oscillator. And we're gonna treat it, we're gonna build it as we would do a finite state machine, okay? And then we're just gonna drop the machine aspect of it and just deal with the harmonic oscillator. What is a finite state machine? Definitely go check out this video here. Um, do a, it's YouTube, Proof by Construction. It's so sad for me that this video only has 11,000 views to, since 2015. It is, the I think, one of the most ingenious um, videos. And the woman's uh, voice is hypnotic. I could listen to it all day long. I really like it. And um, she's going to, basically, we're going to build construct things as though we're building a finite state machine. None of this will be used in the proof, but it helps to get to the background of why things, when we do the proof, we're gonna perform some certain steps, and you will see we're kind of, we're doing it, they're, they're, they're arbitrary, but directed steps, okay? So, what is, in, in summary, what is a finite state machine? So, in order to prove that all the elements, or if you have two sets of, of seemingly different elements, and you want to prove that they, that all the elements elements in one share another property in the other. You can do that. I'm talking infinite number of, of uh, elements, such as the non-trivial zeros, trivial zeros. You can do that with a finite state machine with a certain applying a certain sequence. If you have the conditions met, then it, then you have the, what's called the regular expression. You plug it in, and if they follow that sequence and it turns on, then you have your proof, and then you can move forward. Okay, so originally this was gonna be a proof by construction, um, but we ended up saw after the very end, we said this can be a direct proof. There's, there's no reason, we, that was how we build it though, um, is from this way, but it could be actually a direct proof, which is what it is currently. All right, so harmonic oscillator, but all the meat and potatoes is in the um, oscillator, all right? That's the end result. Okay, so this is the universal oscillator equation, okay? such that A, B, and C are derivatives of C. All right, or not A, B, A and B are derivatives of C. C is good. And so let me go through all of these. I talked about the fundamental frequency with my daughter. That, that is omega naught, okay? That's the fundamental frequency of the system. Upsilon in this situation would become what's uh, called a damping ratio. And uh, damping ratio is what critically determines the system. There is another variable you can when you get into electric circuits I'm going to talk about it a little bit so we're going to come back to that also governors but they're related they, they do the same thing they actually take turns in a way all right quick summary on calculus um, if C is a coordinate let's just say position and my daughter's swinging on it and I'm pushing her 
All right, what is the derivative of, of position? It's velocity. What is the derivative of velocity? It's acceleration, okay? And so if you have something going in a cycle, back and forth, back and forth, and you take the average um, uh, of, of these, it's going to end up equal to zero. So if you go on minus two back and minus two and plus two forward, minus two back, plus two forward, and you average that over time, it ends up at zero. That's not very meaningful for describing any system. So you take t at infinitesimal t, you take the value at an infinitesimal t, and we can just say t equals zero. That's what we're interested in. But it is it's not exactly zero. All right. So here, that's what we're doing here. This is just that's what all of that means. All right, um, there's a lot more you can do with this too, but we're not gonna go beyond that here because we have to go into a driven harmonic oscillator and, and we start to get more and more complicated oscillators because the Riemann oscillator is pretty complicated actually. Uh, it's simple what it does when it reduces, but it is, it is a very complicated oscillator as far as oscillators go. So we have to build up to what type of oscillator it is mostly like. So a driven harmonic oscillator, I guess if you go in order of complexity, that would be the next in line. That would be like me pushing my daughter in a swing, okay? So there's an external force, M is mass in, in this case, and she, the mass would be my, my daughter, her weight, all right? And so this is kind of, so if I get in the, in, in, in the, find the fundamental frequency, then actually she could start going further and further and further. If I push against her when she's coming back, it's gonna slow her down. So you understand this, this resonance aspect of it. Okay, good. So this is the Riemann oscillator, all right? So we are taking arguments S, and everything else is a function of s. And not everything is a function of t, okay? But everything is a function of s, except t. So um, we have now upsilon is a function of s. So for any given input s, we're gonna get a value output. C is gonna give some output. Um, omega is gonna give some output. And um, the zeta, uh, the Riemann oscillator, zeta of s and t, is gonna get some value if you give it s and t. All right, that's simple. I'm sorry if I have to insult your intelligence, but I don't know, you know, who's listening, right? And I don't know everyone, you know, that knows all of this, all right? So let's kind of go over. Where are we interested in? Where's the Riemann zeta function? It's at t equals zero. When we set t equals zero, everything's gonna drop out and it's gonna leave behind the zeta function. You will see it, all right? We're just kind of going over it basically now, all right? So equation one, here we go. Equation one will become the Riemann zeta function in oscillator form. So we're going to look at it, and uh, um, and again, when we set it equals zero, solve back to epsilon. This is the general solution of all the zeros. There's none hiding. That's all of them, right? Here's the equation. We will prove that it equals the zeta function of every single value s. Every single value s. Got it? Not even one missing. And uh, um, and then this is all of the zeros fit into this identity. Okay. Now. We talked about how the oscillator is going to get more complicated as we go. All right, so we have S is possibly a complex number. Even if we're talking about the trivial zeros, we have to understand that we're going to have a lot of complex arguments because with this proof, we're going to be dealing with the non-trivial zeros to show something with the trivial zeros. And yes, you can do that, as you will see. All right, so let me read this. This is, this is where I get chills and goosebumps, really. I, I, this is just amazing stuff and how this actually works with the zeta function. Um, just try your best to take it in. It's really neat. All right, complex arguments, S, which is what we're, we're going to be applying, um, would introduce complex frequencies to the system. But this is a well-studied science and proposes no practical difficulties. In circuit theory, particularly S-domain analysis, the study of circuit response produces a byproduct of the response known as the transfer function. This is where I said, this is where the solution, the, the Riemann hypothesis is going to be buried. This is why I did this right here from that function right there. This function contains all essential information about a circuit and introduces the concept of complex frequencies. Wouldn't you like to know all essential information about the Riemann, Riemann zeta function, such as whether or not it has non-trivial zeros off the critical line or whether or not it has, um, trivial zeros within the critical strip. Well, you can do that if you take the transfer function. So once you have this information, it's very easy then to just go and arrange your solution to prove something from it. When analyzing a signal, this is also where I get goosebumps. When analyzing a signal, the signal is converted from the time domain to the frequency domain or S domain. 
purely a coincidence that they're using s and so did Riemann use s as a, va a variable. Using Fourier transform where time takes the form of s equals i omega. That where I want you to stop. Wait till you see what we define omega as, as the only value that could be equal to, um, to, to make this, this Riemann oscillator function. All right, just look at that, memorize it. All right, to convert into the S domain using Laplace transform, time takes the form of S equals X plus I omega, where X and omega are real numbers. Okay. So look at this. Remember I spoke about the uh, um, upsilon? So if upsilon is zero, that's said this, the system is said to be undamped. If it equals one, it's said to be critically damped. If it's greater than one, overdamped, and one under one, underdamped, I think. In any case, here, x is going to say the same exact thing, the real part of the complex time. All right, so when x equals zero, the system is critically damped. That would mean then that upsilon must be one, because that's that's just by definition of what it means to be critically damped. Upsilon equals one, x equals zero. When less than one is underdamped, greater than one overdamped, and when equal to one undamped, which is would be one, upsilon would then be equal to one. You're going to find in the final proof. This is the most important part of the final proof. The last statement, if you don't remember anything, it is impossible to critically damp any of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. It's impossible. All right. If you could, then the proof is invalid. All right. So that's going to be the really, really important part. All right. It is a complex exponential signal oscillator then that the Riemann oscillator perhaps mostly closely relates as to be shown in complex arguments. Now, ours is even a little more complicated in that X and omega are not necessarily real numbers. OK, we're going to make them complex as well. All right. I omega. Keep an eye on that. Uh, equal to s, all right. It's it's a purely strange coincidence, and the value of s being a period. Uh, this is just a bit bizarre. All right, it is. It's very very. When I saw this, it's like it's kind of like I just remember that feeling. It was like oh my gosh. All right, it's this incredible stuff is about ready to happen. Uh, what is the regular expression that makes this true? I have found that it is this. This is the regular ex expression that we plug into the finite state machine. If we treat this as each term as a finite state, each is the derivative of C, A and B are derivatives of C. If you take this first here, and, and the, on the right-hand side of the equality, of the equal sign, this functional equation, minus e to the power of t times s minus 1. If you integrate that, you will get A of s, and which equals when t is at 0, 1 over s minus 1. And if you take this functional equation when t is not necessarily 0 and integrate it, you will get b of s, where which equals 1 at t equals 0 minus, or minus 1 over s minus 2 squared. And if you integrate this functional equation and not necessarily t equals 0, you'll get c of s, which is 1 over s minus 1 cubed. All right, so it plugs in there. It's got the sequence. It all fits, and none of them have any zeros because zero has no reciprocal and the numerator never vanishes. It's only one. All right, good. That's the regular expression. All right, now, this is really very, very, very interesting stuff here at this point. All right, we're already getting, to, I think it's interesting. Like I said, if you, if, if you don't find it interesting, that's fine. All right, just kind of follow a little bit where we're going with this. Most will recognize this as one of the tangent half angle formulas, but you probably have seen it with u replaced with t. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use u because we're using t for something else. All right. Um, so when I was researching the um, Riemann oscillator, or let's just say the, the Riemann hypothesis, over you know, 17 years it took me to get to this point, um, what I had done is I was kind of I was kind of going at it in three different directions. One was the tangent half angle formula and tangent half angle substitution. Another with the, the Riemann oscillator. And then um, in a couple other areas. I was, I was very interested in the systems. There was there's something, well, I'm not going to go off any tangents, but let's just say a couple different areas. And uh, um, every time I would discover something in one, I would go apply it to the other. And I would kind of just kind of tabulate it and go, okay, that's where this fits. So when they all came together, the Riemann oscillator, the tangent half angle formula, is, is when you start graphing 
um, the motions of an oscillator in phase space. It actually can be tied to the tangent half angle formula, and then you can actually graph the zeta function. Check this out. Or no, better this, any Dirichlet series, any, so any L function. Oh my goodness, this is so cool. All right, so this is RJ Walker's geometric proof of cosine of phi equals one minus u squared over one plus u squared. All right, it's proof without words, slipped into the journal, no more information other than that. Proof without words, I love it, just kind of like, you know, stew on it. <laughs> it's just basically, there it is. End of story. No discussion, no argument. So I was very interested in in these. So I would I would kind of like go plot something and give a, a, a proof without words to myself as I was moving forward step by step until it all kind of came together. All right. So my thought with this is I want to go ahead and I want to I want to generalize this so I can add arguments of s so that so that phi here would be the argument of s. I want to. So what do we do geometrically? How would that work? So I'll show you. So in, in doing so, this is the geometric relationship between S where it's going to be placed and its argument. And you end up with this, um, the points on a fundamental uh, parallelogram, complex conjugate of S plus S minus one, which just so happens to line up the critical line because it's only equal to zero when the real part of S equals one half. All right, watch this. What is a fundamental parallelogram? All right, so this is really, could go really deep, really fast, so I'm just gonna go quickly over it. It has to do with, uh, where you can totally map this to, and, and the Riemann oscillator to elliptic curves, and elliptic curve, cryptology, all of this. All right, so it's all going together. So this is a fundamental uh, parallelogram with this, in this way. All right, so you got S and the complex conjugate of S. I forgot to label it with a, with a hat on there. Um, and minus one, those are the points, okay. With that, you can actually take this in so many different areas, particularly having to do with the fundamental periods, omega here. I'm um, not gonna get into it too much because I'm, I'm working on something else with that and I just I know that we'll never be able to get done with this thing. All right, so, but that's where the, the fundamental parallelogram came from. And it's not in here, it's not in here because it's just not necessary. It's, it's, it comes back later in the proof though, all right. But here, here we go, so this is, this is what you can do after you kind of, after you plot, this is where S would be um, geometrically with respect to its argument here, right? And um, it's on this line so that, and we say I pinned it there or it's constrained there. So that, what does that mean? So constraint has actual meaning in electrical engineering or um, mechanical engineering that you're, it, it's not only engineering, but it's that you have elements in a set and you're replacing one by one in that order. So if I move S, Everything else is going to move because it's all constrained to S. So the argument is going to change, the angle is going to change, the circle over here is no longer the unit circle, it's going to get bigger. In here is going to get bigger. The only thing that's not going to change is this one, this distance here. And we have what's what's really interesting. Remember U, we talked about U. Okay, that's that's the, the point and right there going down to zero on the imaginary line. So we're going to treat this as imaginary line. I think, I think, Yes, um, R.J. Walker did not use the, the real and imaginary, the complex plane. I, actually, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. But I know uh, this one does. So it's constrained to the complex plane. Uh, basically, I'm pinning it to it. All right. So it's, everything's attached and everything moves according to S. All right. So where is, so we can start looking. All right. So have you ever, so the zeta function, all right, the infinite series one of one over n to the power of s. If we integrate that, it gives us the first term of our oscillator, which is one over s minus one. Where is that geometrically on here? Well, if you take a circle having a radius one divided by the imaginary part of s, and we uh, constrain it or pin it tangently to internally tangent to this, this uh, um, uh, unit rectangle, which is constrained to the imaginary and real lines in this fashion. And then we have the, a planar section of a double-sided cone internally tangent to that circle. And then we have another circle internally tangent to the base of that planar section of the double-sided cone. That point right there is one divided by S minus one, no matter what your argument S is. So you move S around, that point right there is one over S minus one. And if we take that function over T, 
its functional equation, these are the points right on the spiral. Now, what is so terribly interesting about this oops, is that where is t <laughs> geometrically represented? Well, it's the arc length of this circle having the radius 1 over imaginary part of s. All right, so why, how do I know that? Because if you take complex argument s, you're getting complex uh, 1 over s minus 1. And if you set the real part equal to 1 and you want to solve back for it, you can say, how long does it take to get from this point to this point? How many t does it equal? And once you get the number, you see that it equals the arc length of this. So this is t, and then you can start to go ahead and measure, find once you found t, that that t is on this circle, then you can go and find, ask other interesting questions, like where is, what is the value of the complex, of, of the t for complex conjugate of s to get from here to here, and it is the arc length of a remainder of the circle. There's so much involved in this. Even the internal circle here is the absolute value of, of, of uh, a of s at, at zero. It gets more bizarre. This could go really deep. We have to go through it. I have to kind of keep going, though. But um, let's go here. So with this, I can, well, let's just say I, I've done it with a, a number. But one, I would say you can do it with any. But you can because it's all multiplica multiplicative factor of zeta function. All of these Dirichlet series are. All right, they all follow this form. A of u. Now, typically, this is A of n. All right, and n equals 1. But you can, we're, we're calling it u because where it came from, it came from the tangent half of the formula. You can still see it in there, a little bit modified here because we were turning things around to get this. Um, and here is the, the result, which leads to the alternating zeta function, which also called the Dirichlet eta function, all right? So, which is just the multiplicative factor of the zeta function. And we can do it with any, any of these Dirichlet series. We can pin them to the, the uh, um, uh, constrain them to the, uh, the tangent half angle formula, at least the generalized uh, tangent half angle formula. What does that mean? What does that look like? Show me, right? That's what you're asking. Okay, let's do it. Let's pick one minus one to the power of t times t to the minus complex conjugate of s. Okay, that fits in that form too. All right, if, if t is n or t is u, that's one of those as well. So you got t to the power of minus complex conjugate of s. All right, where would that be geometrically in here? Well, that function right here is going in this fashion. It starts at this angle here, which is governed by this equation, 1 half times pi over 2 minus argument of s. This angle right here, and as t increases, the angle here gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The radius from the point to here is governed by t equal t to the power of minus real part of s. It's all, and the whole function is governed. It's, it's so if I change s for any argument s, it's going to change the shape of this entire diagram. I wish I had something animated to show that, but it's really cool. I just don't. It's, it's maybe one of maybe one of you guys could do this. Maybe somebody out there is some computer graphics. I'll be happy to walk you through exactly how it works, and then you see that t one area is there. So all of this, the function is now tied to the tangent half angle formula, and we can do something with it with the oscillator because all of the components of the oscillator also can be applied to this. Um, pinned to it so that it changes just by moving s around. So I hope that makes sense. If not, I'm happy to discuss it in the comments. All right, so yes, that was that was this function. And any of them can be fit to this now. All right, that's really a big deal. I'm sorry, it is a very, very big deal. And it gives a lot of insight into things. It makes it possible now for us to prove that there are no trivial zeros within the critical strip. And this is the same proof we used for that there's no non-trivial zeros off the critical line. You have all the information you need to do it. All right, so now we're gonna do it. We're gonna go by, oh, just as fast as it goes, Paul. Mm. Water, okay. So here's the theorem. None of the trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function exists within the critical strip. All right, this is the theorem written out. It is identical to the, the theorem in the paper for the Riemann hypothesis, with the exception of that here we're talking about sigma, which is a trivial zero, and down here we're, we're summarizing the trivial zeros. Symmetric vertices, these two groups, all of this is the same wording, so kind of read over it. I'm not gonna read over it because I get going. Here's the proof outline. Everything is identical to the Riemann hypothesis outline. 
I'm not going to go over it. But here we're talking about singletons. Remember our singletons? S, that's that. Okay, we're going to just go through the proof and you'll understand it a lot better. The only thing we're going to change is the last conclusion. We're not interested in the Riemann hypothesis today. We're going to talk about the trivial zeros. So we'll cross that out. We're going to conclude that no trivial zeros exist within the critical strip as no, ace, no symmetric zeros could exist off the critical line due to epsilon of rho h not contained in s. So they're related in this way, as you'll see. All right, lemma one. Um, all we're doing is that we're just showing that the Riemann zeta function is mathematically identical to a certain harmonic oscillator, which at t equals zero equals the zeta function. I'd like you to stop here and take a look at this beauty right here. This is, this is the um, oscillator in explicit form at t equals zero. This is the zeta function. You can use the zeta function for any argument s, okay? You do have to know the value of epsilon, but that is its functional equation right here, okay? All right, um, well, it's not a functional equation. It's, it's got its integral. All right, but you can plug this into Wolfram Alpha or any calculator, and it will give you um, the value um, for any argument s. Once you know that value, plug it out, plug, plug it all in here, and it's going to give you the value of zeta of s. But we got to prove it, right? You can't just, sh you can't take my word for it. All right, we're just going to prove it. We're going to show how easy that is. All right, first, we got, we're talking about the hyper hypothetical oscillator. I'm going to define my starting point is from an exponential decay rate. Now, you remember I showed you how any Dirichlet series can fit onto that tangent half angle formula. So we're going to start with some, some definition like that that comes from the tangent half angle formula, and we're going to call it a decay rate. Okay, We do it for a reason, because it's mathematically identical to what we need it to be. And it's going to have two arguments. And this function, this Dirichlet series, and it is, is analytic, an analytic function. We can analytic continue. We're going to do it using the Abel-Plana formula. I don't have it in here right now, but you can again go to Wikipedia and you can look up Abel-Plana formula. And we analytic continue it. It does work nicely. We get this, okay? That is the solution. So we can add any uh, argument S and we get that out, any argument Q, and we'll get a value out. All right, now notice about the... the um, in an oscillator, the damping ratio where it fits in with relation to our decay constant. It's just so it's just the ratio, the, the damping ratio is the ratio of that decay constant over the fundamental frequency. That's all it is. It's so we can have an analytic function and we can have a non analytic function, which it's going to be, and we end up with a non analytic function there. But since we can, we're just talking about a multiplicative factor. It's very easy to get both an infinite series definition of epsilon and this. You'll see how. Okay, it's just it's not too complicated. All right. So, what is epsilon of s? Where are we at? All right. So replace. Remember omega. I said it had an s domain s equals. Um, I don't remember. I think remember no. I times omega. All right. Well, we're going to replace omega naught with i times comps conjugate s because it does something cool. You do. And then S, where S is a complex conjugate S. And we're going to replace Q with complex conjugate S. Not imaginary, but just complex, complex conjugate. All right? And what we want to do is, because we got we got to do something really cool. I, I, you're, I'm just going to show it to you. All right. Oh, man. I'm getting tired. This is, old. This is long. Holy crap. <laughs> All right. All right. Bear with me as I fall asleep. Okay, no. I'm doing good here. All right. Um, I hope you're not falling asleep. All right. Mm. Yeah, so once we do that, we're going to refer to omega naught. We're just going to call it a function of s, omega of s, okay? And we're just going to recognize it as a function of s. It's, it's very simple. So all you do, if you have any argument s, we can multiply it by i and give us complex conjugate. That's, that's all omega of s is. And remember, it's relationship, all right? It's just a multiplicative factor of epsilon and a. Okay, good. So all we're going to do is divide it by, divide it by a of s, the epsilon, or omega from a of s, and we get epsilon. We get the analytic continuation, even though it's not an analytic function. You see that? And we also can get the infinite series of it. So isn't that pretty neat? So we get any value of epsilon from infinite series. And no, it's not a Dirichlet series, because the Dirichlet series are analytic. This one is not. But we get it. It's just a multiplicative factor. We just divide out to is you know, later or multiply it in. Uh, in this case, we have to multiply it in. Good. All right, so this is epsilon. Um, 
it's defined as that, but we don't really define it. We actually just kind of solve for it. So, all right, but we defined uh, the decay constant. Now, we do need to def define our, from the regular expression before. We can define this C of S as anything we want. We're going to define it as the fourth term of, of that so that it fits with everything logically. For, so the derivatives all have that regular expression. And we're going to substitute the function equation in to the universal oscillator equation for what we're going to call the Riemann oscillator. Okay, this is it. And what happens when we let t equal zero, everything cancels out, Brrrp. leaving behind just the zeta function. You see? And all instances of the complex conjugate cancel. So we are not getting an analytic function from a non-analytic function. We're getting an, an analytic function from a multiplicative factor of a non-analytic I can't say it. Analytic function from a multiplicative factor of an analytic function. So we just cancel all of that multiple out and we end up with this. But isn't that the most beautiful cancellation you've ever seen before in all your life? I think it is. Okay? Because now we have the zeta function in oscillator form. And we can do this too. If we analytic continue the zeta function, uh, you can go to Wikipedia, they use their Hurwitz zeta function, I think, and they just let one equal the second variable equals one, and I, I believe one or zero, I think it's one, and then it becomes a data function, and it becomes this. So everything cancels out. So you could use either form of upsilon to cancel out to get the zeta function when you let t equals zero. Right there, see that? Plug in upsilon, all of the is c of s, and put it in explicit form. So this member one over s minus one, that's the first term. This is all the second term is everything from uh, and the second term with a upsilon, right? Upsilon's in here. And the last term is simply uh, omega naught squared. Remember that? Well, now we didn't call it I times complex time of S. All that cancels out starting, I started in here in the middle. You get it, all right? This is, this is not complicated if you're a mathematician. It's just, it cancels. Good. That is proof of lemon one. What do we do? All right, we defined A of S and Q using infinite series. We let omega naught equal I times complex conjugate of S and let Q equals complex conjugate S. I'm getting tired, need to drink water, hold on. Which gave us upsilon of S. And we defined C of S from the regular expression discussed earlier. We applied these definitions to the universal oscillator equation and we turned it on. We set T equals zero and the universal oscillator equation reduced to the Riemann zeta function. That's all we did. All right, so that's, that's level one. All right, lemma two is simple. It all takes place on this page in three sentences. The lemma is that only the second term of zeta of s in the form of one, the oscillator equation, has zeros when zeta of s equals zero. That's all, right? That's a, b, and c cannot be equal zero. We don't want to have that mutual exclusive property. So we're proving, before we prove that they don't have the mutual exclusive property, we have to prove that there's no zeros in them. So, uh, Omega of s equals zero when s equals zero. Remember, it's i times complex kind of s. So only time it's ever going to be zero is when s equals zero. But that's not a zero of zeta function, so we don't have to worry about that going to zero. That's proven. A and b and c are multiplicative inverses of s minus one. Remember, one over s minus one, one over s minus one squared and cubed. All right. The numerator does not vanish. And because zero has no reciprocal, a, b, and c have no roots. Therefore, the only second term in zeta function in the form of one has zeros and it's when zeta of s equals zero, namely those at upsilon of zero, which proves lemma two. Look over that, there's nothing wrong with that, it's very simple stuff. All right, lemma three, my favorite of the three. Actually, I kinda like the first one pretty neat. The second one's not too exciting, but this one is really neat actually too. This is where we get into the guts and the glory because it's the last lemma that we need to do one of two things. Prove there are no trivial zeros within the critical strip, or prove the Riemann hypothesis. Either way, we can do that with this. When we're done with this lemma, it's pretty much there. All right, we're just saying that they have Riemann's a function has the mutual exclusive property that this is type one and this is type two. So look at it. I'm not reading it all out. It has to do with upsilon being zero and real part equals one half. Upsilon not equals zero if and only if real part of s is not equal to one half. And these are all happen when the zeta function equals zero. All right, and this last line, actually, this puts it in set form, set, this set language. All right, again, I don't want to lose people at this point, and I don't want to lose myself too because I'm getting tired, but this is the same way of saying this in set form, okay? 
All right, so I'm not gonna read it. All right, proof of lemma three. All right, let's go revisit. From the beginning, I showed you the only solution for all the zeros is this in the top. That's That would be actually it was equation six, I believe. No, not equation six, we haven't got equation six. All right, this is, uh, I don't remember where it was, but it was early in the, the slide. But this is explicit form. If we take A of S and C of S and we just expand everything out to what is defined as, it reduces to this really neat little identity. Why is this neat? Because our fundamental parallelogram resurfaces as desired. And what is interesting about that? Because that equals zero only when the real part of one half equals one half. You see, that's the way it was planned. All right, so that numerator only equals that when the real part is equals one half because this other term over to the left, this doesn't have any zeros, all right? You can't get i out of here, all right? So it's always gonna be in there. So there's no zeros. The only zero is in this multiple right here, which is are the points. You can think of it as a fundamental parallelogram. I'm calling it, so it's the way I identify it, all right? Now, look at here, here's where to prove it. All right, three, okay. So we let upsilon equals zero and it reduces as such. This statement right here implies real part one half to real part of S minus one set equal to zero, add one both sides, divide by two, that is real part of S equals one half. So that implies it one way, and uh, um, we know the other term has no zeros, so we can't get that I out. It's never gonna go away, because there's nothing on the left-hand side, it's one, to cancel it, all right? So let's kind of go, good. So we're gonna call that, that's so important, that's the first type, we're calling that equation five. Equation five, all right? Very important. And now the type two, so this uh, doesn't reduce any further, doesn't do anything fancy, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna expand it out and solve for the real part of S. So you express everything in explicit form and then solve back for the real part of S and you get this quadratic, which I don't think Greg could do this one in his head, but it's really neat. Um, but it actually could be reduced. And that was another mathematician I was working with, or, or not working with, he was working against us, um, but he, he did come up with a way to simplify this. So it's pretty neat um, because it makes, it eliminates an entire step of the paper. So the original proof had 10 steps even when I was doing this video. Um, we now reduce it to nine steps. Because we can do this, let's, well, let's just do it. Let's examine the, uh, um, this function. This is the most important right here, most important result so far. All right, so what we're saying is these have all the symmetric zeros in it off the critical line. Right here, this is the general solution. And you see there are two of them. So we have one, we're gonna have another one through the point one half. You see that? So we're gonna have that. Let's go look at it. What we do is we're gonna take this form, solve back for upsilon, set it equal to this form of upsilon because now we have the plus and minus so that we can add we can give arguments to the left hand side give it one s any s and see if it's a zero so let's just see if one over five plus i over seven or i times one over seven is a zero to the zeta function we can do this with wolfram alpha just set it in there if you want to do it from the numbers um that's the value right there it'd be cool and plug it in and sure enough do we get the result um oh before we go to the result just note, if you're new to Wolfram Alpha, they denote the complex conjugate as caret over the, caret to the asterisk. All right, good. So it does, it pops up both solutions for this, and we can just go check to see if it's zero if they're symmetric across the real and critical line. Let's plot them out. Well, there's one fifth over plus I over seven, and it's little partner in crime, and he's outside the critical strip, so it's not a zero, he's past the one. All right, well, Anyway, let's do the complex conjugate. This is how we can apply it in there. And uh, um, we can do it first with the, the positive or the negative solution and it gives oh, no solution. So we gotta do the positive of the quadratic, plug that in. And there we got both of them out with the positive. And we can plot them. And we notice that they are symmetric across the real line, but they're not symmetric across the critical line, okay? But you see, this function is definitely what we wanted, all right? It's given us the values. We can actually pop out and test the zeros in this area to see if mathematically it's possible for any of these zeros to be symmetric across the critical line. Let's go over that a little bit more. 
Riemann symmetric vertices property. All right, if the imaginary parts are equal, right there, they're equal, then the real parts must add to one of these. All right, imaginary parts are equal. Is this distance here to here adding up to one? No, it's a little bit more than one. So if this is one half and this is one half, they add up to one. If this is one fourth real part and this is three fourths, they add to one. We are going to test to see if any of them are symmetric because it's going to tell us a lot about our other hypothetical zeros with those vertices that we talked about earlier in those groups. All right, simplify. Mm -mm -mm. All right, this is what we got from the mathematician. So basically just pull out the one half and we're left with this, this uh, other term that has no real solutions. It has no real solutions at all. Therefore, it's never going to go to zero. All right, so we're, talking, we're solving for the real part of s. So we have one half, we bring it out of the quadratic. Remember, it's the most important equation of the star. Pull one half out of there and it reduces. This is just another form of this. Really nice form, makes it very useful because we can just evaluate this, this second term right here and see that you know there's no way to get i out of here. It's, it's always going to be complex. It has no real solutions. And that could be proven, but it doesn't need to. So sometimes you got to prove things because it's new. Sometimes it's already been proven, like 1 plus 1 equals 2. I don't, every time I come across 1 plus 1, I don't need to go prove that it's 2 again. Same thing as I don't need to prove that, um, that, that this has no you know, real solutions. It's, it, it just doesn't. Um, there's no way to get that i out of there by the rules of complex arithmetic. All right, so what you have, since you have no real solutions, um, this is never going to equal 0. Therefore, 1 half can never be an argument in the type 2 solution. You see? Because for a real part to equal 1 half, this would have to go to zero. But that's not possible because there's no zeros, has no real numbers at all. So real part of half, one half, can never be in the type two. It's a type two solution. Does that make sense? So at that point, we have proven it both ways. We proved that the, the type one can't be in the type two and vice versa. All right. Therefore, arguments having a real part one half are not applicable to six since there is only one other type of solution for the Riemann zeta function zeros a zero is critical if and only if epsilon of s equals zero which reverse implies that the two types of solutions for zeta of s equals zero are mutually exclusive which proves lemma three good now all i need is to prove the theorem but first remember i said the oscillator is not um critically damp it's impossible. Here's why. This is our type 2 solution. All right, type 2 solution. What would happen if upsilon would equal 1 in here? All right? There's no real solution for when upsilon equals 1, plus or minus 1, or plus or minus the quadratic. All right, let's just take a look at it. So these are all of the solutions. What happens is that reduces. When it's 1, this is what happens. We get that i in there again, and it can't be taken out. You see that? There's no real solutions when upsilon equals one. All right, this is very important. Type, there are no critically damp type two zeros at all. All right, upsilon can never equal plus or minus one. Very, very important. Note that now, don't forget it. If you don't, if you don't like the idea of that, you just go read through it and you'll see there are no real solutions. All right, see even the calculators will tell you it's false. All right, it's just not possible. All right, that's my, my generic way of summing that up. Let's prove this theorem. Hmm? prove there are no non-trivial no trivial zeros with every critical square all right now we're going to bring in the set theory by proof of lemma three one may now discuss upsilon as a function that maps the trivial zero to its counterpart across the critical line it's as a function from the set rho to the set one minus complex conjugate of rho rho are the non-trivial zeros we've got to discuss the non-trivial zeros first before we say anything about the trivial zeros then let s Remember that wording? I said we're using the same word. We're even using the same notation for the set. Let S be the set of all upsilon of hypothetical non-trivial zeros not equal to zero, should they exist, as uh, that hypothetical um, non-trivial zero, rho h, must be a member of all the other non-trivial zeros. See, we're talking members and sets. It's the same wording. If the Riemann hypothesis is correct, the image of rho h under upsilon, denoted upsilon of rho h, is the value of upsilon when applied to the hypothetical non-trivial zeros. In other words, it's saying that upsilon of rho h is the output of upsilon for input arguments rho h. Does it make sense? Not even complicated. But we have to remember that as we're going through and trying to disprove it and find counter arguments. Always remember that. 
Uh, the identity of the real parts equal to one uh, is necessary then for any of those solutions for the one minus complex conjugate of hypothetical non trivial zero. It's necessary for them to exist within the critical strip. And likewise, one minus rho h solutions with them. So substitute rho in for s for either the positive or negative expression of the reduction of seven. Then substitute one minus complex conjugate of rho h in for either the positive or negative wall or of as well. Look, all we're doing is this. We're just taking the explicit form. Oops, explicit form. Remember, I said that the, that mathematician helped. He pulled that one half out. All right, we're setting that's rho. All right, and then we're doing one minus rho on the other side. We're just putting that explicit form. All right, so it's one half of that one. The real part solution for that plus the real part of the other, and set it equals zero, and solve away. That's all we're doing. All right. So the first, what happens is one plus one. The, all of this can be rewritten as this right here. This first equation here, because the imaginary parts are equal. Remember, they have to be equal by definition. So we can then reduce everything down to this. Everything reduces because this. Are, if you look at the explicit form of Upsilon, you'll see that these two. Um, radicals are equal. All right, so you can just check this yourself. They're not complicated. And this has no real numbers, right? You can't get rid of the i. So this multiple multiplier out here has no real solution. All right, so for any argument, the substitution implies upsilon of rho h equals plus or minus upsilon of 1 minus complex conjugate of rho h. That is the general solution for all the non trivial zeros off the critical line. It's also the general solution for all type two zeros, all of them, trivial zeros, non-trivial off the critical line, and um, hypothetical trivial within the critical zero. They're all in here. They're all in here because the only one, other one had only one element. That's when the real particle is one half. So look at our possibilities. Well, if we set upsilon to these other complex conjugates, remember you got these four corners. Okay, upsilon, right? We have these, cor these corners, rho, one minus rho, one minus complex conjugate of rho, all right? Those are all points on these vertices, all right? So we know, are there any solutions? We're doing plus or minus. What do we get? The, out of three of them, so we have, let's go back, plus or minus. If we take all of these, we have three out of the four possibilities all only occur when the real part of rho equals one half, mathematically. You could do this, we'll work it out. You'll see all three of them have only real part one half. So since real part of one half, we showed has no real part in the real solution. Remember, when we pulled that one half out, there's no real solution for that. One half cannot be in type two. So we have to disregard them. It makes no sense. Also, upsilon would be in the denominator is undefined. So it's just, it's just um, extraneous. There's extraneous solutions. All right. So we only have one other choice, and that is upsilon equal to minus one minus upsilon rho. All right, that's it. And what does that do? That reduces down to our solution for all the non-trivial symmetric zeros off the critical line. All of them fall into this. Two times the imaginary part of rho h plus i equals zero, which is complete nonsense, actually, because the imaginary part cannot be equal to a complex number. So this one as well, it's extraneous. All right, this is, so you can look at here, why? But here's even further. Some have actually looked at this, go, oh, I can, you can get a solution. There is a solution. No, because the only argument where that would be possible is when upsilon equals plus or minus one. So even if you don't, even if you think this is a solution, it only occurs when upsilon is equal to plus or minus one. Do you understand? And we already went over that it can't be equal to plus or minus one right here. Okay, it can't be. There are no critically damp solutions. That is not a solution because it only occurs when upsilon equals plus or minus one because there are no real, solution, real solutions, all right, in seven. All right, so we're going to summarize the consequences of this. We're going to prove, to prove this here. No imaginary parts of S exist in the type two solution. No imaginary parts of S exist in the type two solution. So they're all real, all real numbers. Trivial zero. As if the Riemann hypothesis were incorrect, then the image of rho h under upsilon, again denoted upsilon of rho h, must be the value of v of upsilon when applied to rho h. Therefore, the type two solutions are all real. 
and none of the type 2 solutions are symmetric across the critical line. Therefore, S is a singleton set, while one may consider minus upsilon of one minus complex crown of zero of a row, the function upsilon of, of row h does not take the value. Remember we said that upsilon is equal to minus? doesn't take the value of it as there does not ex any exist. There does not exist some row h in the function's domain such that that equality would be possible. Similarly, given that s is defined as a set of all upsilon not equal to zero, the above implies that no upsilon takes the value in s as there does not exist any row h in the function's domain such that one should have an upsilon of row h contained in s, set s, nor that any upsilon of row h takes multiples or all values in s, as upsilon of row h is not contained in s for every point rho h in upsilon of rho h's domain. Given that upsilon maps rho to one minus complex conjugate rho, that is a function from the set rho to set one minus complex conjugate rho, the pre-image by definition or inverse image of the set one minus complex conjugate of rho, hypothetical, is a subset, as you know it should be, of one minus complex conjugate of rho. So, right, if it's off the critical, if it's a non trivial zero, that, but non critical, non trivial, that's a subset of the non trivial, under upsilon, denoted as what? What? A pre image. Right here it is, the subset of rho, and thus its only element is null. It's the fiber over one minus complex conjugate of rho. What does that mean for us? That's, that's what results from what we just did. It, it is the chilling proof that no trivial zeros exist within the critical strip. The following is the only logical conclusion. The negative solution for seven is extraneous. No real solutions are math mathematically possible in that region, in the region of z between zero and one. No real solutions exist in there. All right, so you can take that and go apply and look. Say, we were looking for a real solution. They, they'd have to be real because that's the type two solution. They all have to be real. But no real solutions are mathematically possible in that region. Therefore, there can be no trivial zeros in that region. Nice that? You like that? No trivial zeros exist within the critical strip. Why is that chilling? Because we just proved the Riemann hypothesis as well. And that's where this comes from. The following is the only logical conclusion. The negative solution for seven is extraneous. While uh, the type two planar solution of property two exists, as proven in lemma three, it is not critically symmetric and therefore does not comply with property one. Because six contains the entirety of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function that do not have real part one half, as proven in lemma three, six contains only trivial zeros. Because all non-trivial zeros must comply with property one, no non-trivial zeros could exist as type two planar solutions. And because there are only two types of solutions for zeta of s equals zero, as zeta of s has property two, all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function are restricted to the type one linear solution. Since the type one linear solution is on the critical line, all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function have a real power one half. And the real Riemann hypothesis is correct. All right, now I know I lost some of you here I feel it. All right, this is the area you gotta work out on your own. I've worked out a lot with a lot of other people. Just kind of go hammer it out. If you wanna prove it for yourself, I like the fact that we can prove there are no, no um, trivial zeros within the critical strip with this proof. It's really beautiful because we proved that all type two must all be real solutions. And then we just go and prove that it's mathematically impossible for any real numbers to exist this solution in that area. All right, isn't that neat? Okay, because you can't get rid of the eye. <laughs> you can't get rid of the eye. All right, so, um, yeah, I think it's chilling. <laughs> Just kidding. Look, guys, I've been doing this a long time. All right, I don't want to be doing any more videos with it. I don't, but I'm going to keep doing it, and I'm going to get them hopefully shorter. But I think it's time. I think it's time to uh, move to the next level, don't you think? Time for you mathematicians who are not really on board with this to send it to your professors. Professors, it's time to send it to your your colleagues. I think it's time to start um, poking holes in it hard. All right, time time to look into this. I think. All right, at the very least, do this. 
All right, you don't need to do anything for me. But at the very least, for yourself, say to yourself, I don't see any errors in this proof this time. Just say it to yourself. You can say to yourself at this time, I, and you can say what you want. You can do what you want. But this is what, what I would say to myself. It's time to stop mourning it. It looks like it's pretty good. Looks like it's a good proof. And uh, lots more time to go hammer it out to find an error. I'm, I got all the time in the world. Uh, I'm not really zipping around with this. I'm just kind of every year or so kind of go ahead and put something out. <coughs> um, but I, I do plan on starting to uh, um, branch out a little bit more and uh, with a little more confidence. It's been a long time, guys. You've had plenty of time to look at it. Start showing me the errors, all right? I want to see it. And uh, I know this is long, and uh, I really respect you all taking the time here. And I also know that, guys, I'm really tired. All right, it's been a long day. I wanted to get this out to you before the weekend. Uh, so if I didn't explain all this, great. But read over this, look over it, um, and feel free to tell me what you think. All right, again, in the comments. Um, trolls and stuff like that, I love that you're here. It's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Um, but don't talk math, <laughs> all right? Don't talk math unless you know the math, okay? Because I just I don't want to do it. I'll talk math. I'll have fun with you, okay? I'll, I'll respond. I'll talk about all sorts of cool stuff. But I'm not going to talk math with you because you're just wasting my time. I'm only interested in mathematicians um, when I'm talking math. I'm interested in mathematicians or those who are willing to learn. Now, if you're a troll and you want to learn math, hey, and this is cool, let's do it, all right? But I see some of, them, some of you probably are. Um, but probably not trolls. There's a couple in here threatening to have the web, the, <laughs> the YouTube channel taken down. And I'm like, okay, well, for what? <laughs> um, yeah, so let's have some fun in the comments. Uh, I don't have all the time in the world, but I definitely want to. But as far as math, don't try to talk about the math unless you understand it, okay? And it, for those of you out there who are far better mathematicians than me, let's start some discussions. I'd I could learn from you. Go ahead and tell me something, all right? Thank you for the long evening, and uh, um, just have a good night.